everyone. Welcome to the Quarter Life Crisis podcast. My name is Chloe and I will be your host today. Um, just in case there's people... Also, I don't know what that was. Let's just move on. If there's people that have not heard my voice before, I would first say consider yourself lucky. I yap and yap until I can yap more. <laughs> um... I'm Chloe and I am going through a quarter life crisis, hence the name, but I, the first episode was just about my life in general and the second episode was about my relationship with my mum and everything that happened there. I think it's important to speak about because not only has it moulded my life and how I live now I guess it also is important for you to get to know me I just think it's nice you feel connected in a way um but this episode is gonna be slightly long now I say that and last week I yapped for an hour and a half this one's gonna be not that long but but still a long one because we're I'm just going to speak about narcissism in general so narcissism for me my introduction into it was through my mom and how she treated me but I actually did not know what it meant or what it was the word narcissist to call someone a narcissist I thought it's just someone that loves themselves Like, oh, that girl over there looking in the mirror is a narcissist. She just loves the way she looks. Or that guy over there who can't stop speaking about himself, just loves himself so much, is a narcissist. These traits are part of it. But just because you do one thing like that does not in any way mean you're a narcissist. Now, a few disclaimers. I'm not a professional. This is just me yapping away. (laughs) about what I've learned or researched, what I've experienced. I don't have any kind of professional head knowledge, anything about this topic. So please keep that in mind. (laughs) My word is not like the utmost truth. Um, And also my mom has never and probably will never be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder but I would very confidently bet my life on the fact that she does have it if she ever went to seek help and get diagnosis and things she never would she never will but I'm very confident that she has got that so with that let's start so yeah have you think you can think about it have you ever met someone who's so self-obsessed puts you down when you're feeling good about yourself or even if you're feeling down about yourself and they're like digging their heel right in or if they they may constantly invalidate your feelings most people try to avoid these specific people or you kind of bear the really awkward interaction and then you're like, I'll never see them again, I'll avoid them at all costs. Usually that's how it goes, but sometimes, what if you can't escape them? What if this person, this narcissistic person, was actually a parent? You have to rely on them. And some parents, caregivers, really try their hardest to do the best for you, give you the best start in life, give you the best chance, give you everything you need for life, to set you up for life. And others try their hardest to not do that. I'll only speak from experience from now on because I can't say as a general, this is what this person will do. I don't know. I only know my mum. My mum kind of sat in the middle. She did try her hardest in some things and then other things did not give a shit. So, I've got a 50-50 going on. Now, I think it's very, very important to distinguish the difference between narcissistic personality disorder. So, I'm going to call it NPD from now on because what a tongue twister. (laughs) 
but it's very important to distinguish between NPD, an actual disorder, and then narcissistic traits. Because yes, a person with NPD has narcissistic traits, that's what makes them a narcissist, but if there's a very just average Joe and Yeri loves to speak about himself and Yeri makes everything about him, but other than that, he's a good guy, that's not a narcissist, that's just someone with issues or someone who has just been brought up that way or someone who thinks that way about themselves or it could be an insecure person that's not a narcissist and I really want to stress that if you're listening to this and you think oh my mom acts like that or my brother or my dad or whatever yeah that every I think everyone has at least one or two of these traits in them but because you have one or two traits does not mean you're a narcissist. You have, I think if you have over half of these, just chances are you might be one. <laughs> but if it's one or two, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't just label it narcissism and then move on with your life. I'd just, yeah, don't do that, please. Now, I actually didn't know this, but this is a fun fact. Apparently, MPD only affects about 1% of the population. It's often rooted in early developmental issues. And this could be excessive pampering. So think of like a princess or a prince. Oh, they don't have to do anything. And I will admit this was me as a child. I did not have to do anything. My mum did a lot for me. And then as I got older, it changed. Um, Or it could be on the other end of the spectrum, very extreme criticism during childhood um now I will say my mom fell into that category she told me some stories about her parents and things and they could be true they could not I'm not gonna say they're not because there's no hard evidence to say this is not true but everything my mom said to me about my dad family other things like that have proven to not be quite true Um, kind of spun in a way that makes her feel like the victim and I'm not victim blaming she very much in some circumstances was a victim I'm just saying to look at this as it is you kind of have to take everything that my mom said with a pinch of salt um but my mom does fall into the extreme criticism during childhood And it says, um, people with MPD have a distorted self-image and are highly sensitive to any perceived criticism or defeat, which is very, very true, can I say. So that's just a general, what is it? Now we'll go into the signs and symptoms. And there's quite a few. I'll go over the main ones and the, the list goes on and on, honestly, but I've picked out the main ones and I've also, I will be giving little examples just to help people because I'm someone who needs an example of something to understand it it's just how my brain works but also if you say like oh (sighs) now my mind goes blank if you say like oh someone has a really exaggerated sense of self-importance but what does that mean you know I'm not clever enough to understand these big words so I will insert some examples One of them is that they treat their children as an extension of themselves. So you're not kind of seen as your own person. You're seen as a part of them, which biologically, yes, but not in that sense. So it would be any anything good that you do, anything you achieve, anything you excel at is seen as a direct reflection of her and her parenting. Um, And the same goes for any mistakes or failures. If you mess up somewhere or if you do something that is... Like, if you do something in public and it's, oh, that was a bit embarrassing. It's, like, ten times worse for her because that's embarrassing for her, if you get what I mean. So, just an example. My sister, she's um, older than me. She's in her early 40s now. And she had kids quite young so she didn't really focus on her career she always wanted kids she had her kids and then she focused on her career and she really wanted to go into childcare, nursery school kind of setting so she started an apprenticeship and she was in her late 30s when she started an apprenticeship which 
People think apprenticeships are for 16 year olds, but they're not, not always. But anyway, she started this apprenticeship and I was so happy for her, you know, cause she'd been on about really wanting to knuckle down on a career. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy for you, like, you, you do you girl. My mom met this with such negative outlooks and especially with the place that my sister started her apprenticeship. My mum was saying it's not a good establishment, it's not going to work out how my sister wants it to, the people that worked there, my mum just always had something negative to say. But then, flip the switch, when my sister like graduated, when she passed her apprenticeship with flying colours, she did so well, all of a sudden, my mum's going up to people, friends, whoever, saying wow, look, my daughter, she um, she works for the council in a nursery setting, she's she's doing so well in life, I'm so proud, like, oh, all my children just do so well in life, like, oh, what on earth, what on earth, but that's what that is, and also a negative, <laughs> I'll just insert this, because I think it's so funny, as a young teen, well, I say young teen, 17, as a old teen, <laughs> You obviously go to a lot of parties. People are turning 18 and part, it's party central. Like you just go to a lot of parties, house parties, actual parties. When you turn 18, you go clubbing. In this point in, in life, at this time, drugs are introduced. You will hear of them. You will see them. You will be around them. And obviously, it's your choice whether you try them, whether you don't, how you deal with that. Obviously, it is a reflection of parenting as well. Like, if someone really struggles with excess of things and whatever. But that's that's a different story. But my mum and I hadn't really spoke about drugs. I never wanted to go on a drug binge and try all these different drugs. But I was at a party, I was 17, and there was weed there. And it was being passed around, and I thought, yeah, I'll try it. I was already so, so drunk, I felt no effects from it. I almost coughed up half of my lung and I was like, I'm never doing that again. Don't like it. I don't don't know how. I really don't know how. My mum found out. I still, to this day, don't know how my mum found out that I was trying weed at a party. I asked all my friends. No one said I said... no, No one said that they snitched and I really just don't unless she fucking drove past and saw me at that point trying the spliff because it was outside I have not got a bloody clue but she found out anyway and I stayed over at a friend's that night and the next day I went home and the fallout was nothing short of spectacular post-apocalyptic kind of thing I was dead I may as well have died that day she was calling me a slag she said if I wanted to act like one I can go on the streets, she was saying how I'm so disgusting and dirty, how dare I do something like this, my sister was there as well, she was saying all of this in front of my sister, she was really really going in on me and I'm just sat there like what on earth is going on, like this is the kind of behaviour when you reject a guy and he calls you a slut and you're like I'm not really one but thank you anyway, this this was the this was the kind of reception I was getting from my mum and I was just I was so in disbelief because I'd never been treated like this before. I had never seen her blow up so much. Even on my stepdad, like, she'd argue, but this was something different. This was absolute different level. Um, She rang the school the next week because I was doing my A-levels. At this point, I think I was doing my A-levels. I was in, like, the first year. She rang the school and got me a drugs counsellor. And this... This is how the, um, also embarrassing, but this is how the conversation went. She goes, hi Chloe, I'm whoever. Uh, Why are you here today? So I tell her the story about, I went to a party, I tried weed, didn't like it, never going to do it again. My mum rang the police and now I'm here. And this woman, bless her soul, looks at me and she goes, I don't know why you're here. And I go, I don't know why I'm here either. And we kind of mutually agreed that I don't need to be here. And I never went to another counselling session because I'm not addicted to drugs. I literally tried weed once. And my mum was just another woman. (laughs) For those few weeks after, she was just a different fucking woman. The way she'd speak to me, it was absolutely disgraceful. Um, But yeah, those are the good and bad 
scenarios when they see you as an extension of themselves anything that you do reflects on them basically um the second thing is that they play their children against one another so i researched and if there's more than one child there tends to be a golden child who can do no wrong and then a lost child who is kind of like they can do whatever they want but then also get berated for it it's a it's a it's a weird dynamic that is now the lost child was absolutely my brother um he always called himself the black sheep like the one that everyone overlooks and no one really everyone always thought he'd have such a a dark life like such a bad path in life um and he was on the wrong path in life but he did quickly turn it around and now everyone's like we don't even recognize him like he's a completely different person but anyway off topic and then you have the golden child which was me which is weird because the golden child is the one who can do no wrong but then i'd get berated as well for doing things that weren't right in my mom's eyes very very strange dynamic but she would constantly bitch about us to each other she used to tell my siblings I did nothing, I didn't have a drive to do anything, when every single day I was applying to so many jobs because I didn't work, I wasn't in school at this point. And every single job that replied back to me, she'd turn me down for it, she didn't want me to go to certain places, why would you want to work there because it's this kind of establishment? And obviously, me being the naive young child I was, the little girl in the big world that I was, I believed that I was like, I don't want to work there because it's horrible because my mum said so. And then she'd bitch about my sister to me, she'd bitch about my brother to me, she'd bitch about my sister to my brother, yada yada, the list goes on. Um, The third is having a petty rivalry with her children. Now, this is essentially jealousy. She's jealous of her own children. Now, with mothers, it's primarily with their daughters because... It's a woman pitting herself against another woman, even if that is her own daughter. I noticed this a lot when I got older. Um, And bearing in mind, I'm a teenager. Teenage boys are looking at me because they're teenage boys. And she's getting jealous about it. Like, if there was a guy, I say guy, a young boy, but if there was a guy looking at me, she'd be like, oh, come on, we need to go here. And she'd, like, drag me away. Or she'd be like, oh, we're going home now immediately slight remarks she'd make about me like last episode I said I wasn't wearing any mascara at one point because I just couldn't be bothered and she was like your eyes look really small without mascara like you can't even see them and and she was just at me for no reason I'd literally just gone downstairs I was breathing existing and out of the blue she's like Chloe this is what I think about your appearance today I'm like thanks mom um and I also remember this was my first ever day and I think I was 16 or 17 my first official day And I was speaking to this guy, and he seemed nice. He wasn't, but at this point, he was nice. And he said to me, do you want to go walk in this park nearby where I lived with your dog? Because at this point, we'd just got a dog. He was a little puppy, a little German shepherd. We called him Milo. Well, I called him Milo. And he was a gorgeous little boy. But the fact that this guy was saying, like, as a first date, do you want to go to the park? I was like, absolutely, I'd love that. So I went on this date, and then we got back. And this was the first time my mum met him. And immediately, he was, he was like, he was an all right looking bloke. And immediately, my mum is like, as as he'd left, she was like, why like, why would you want to see him? Oh, I really don't get good vibes from him. Or like, oh, guys only want one thing. And, and she was just saying all this stuff like, mum, shut up. In the end, the second time he came around, he came around to my house and we went into my room and watched a movie. Nothing happened. I didn't want anything to happen. But we were just lying in my bed and we were just watching a movie. And then he left. And literally, the next day, he texts me and he's like, I don't think I can give you what you want. And I was like, a relationship. This was my first introduction to, like, men. And I was like, you don't think, you can't give me a relationship. Okay, sure, fair enough, whatever. I'm glad he's gone. Anyway, the third, (laughs) the fourth, sorry, is gaslighting. Now, I think gaslighting is another word being thrown around so, so much. I think the understanding of what it is and how it happens has come around quite a lot. But it's still something that has a lot of 
misinformation about it. Now, gaslighting for me, in my personal experience with my mom, it was more of emotional gaslighting. It wasn't it wasn't like you said this you absolutely did no I'm not taking any it was just with my emotions so one instance and it was the same every time there was one instance where my stepdad got back from work and it was quite late at night I was in the living room doing my art homework on the table and my mum was sat on the sofa my stepdad walks in, he stands in the threshold between the um, the living room and we had like a, a weird middle room that was just like an everything room kind of thing. It was everything that you wanted it to be. And he was stood in the threshold and he put his hands on his hips. He was just resting his hands on his hips, you know, a normal human stance. And my mom, they're already having a bit of a heated debate. And my mom out of nowhere just goes, why are you standing like that? You look gay. And immediately, I just look, and I'm like, why the fuck would you say that? Like, what a strange thing to say. And immediately, my stepdad snaps. This was a man at the end of his tether. Now, this was not that long before they broke up, so go figure. But he flips out. He starts screaming, shouting. He goes into the kitchen, which, which was just through the, the spare room, weird room thing, he went into the kitchen, he was opening the door, slamming the door, opening the door, slamming the door. He opened all the cupboards and threw all the pots and pans about, screaming, shouting, thrown up. <laughs> and at this point, I was really emotional because I'd never seen him like this before. And I was actually quite hysterical, if I'm being honest. And my mum just said, come on, we'll go. So she took me and we walked to the end of the road that we lived on. And it was there was a McDonald's at the end of the road. And we just stood there on the car park it was literally like 10, 11 p.m. No, it wasn't that late. 9 p.m., I want to say. It was late, but I don't think it was that late. Jesus Christ. But my mum rang my sister, and my sister came to pick us up. And we all sat in her car, and I was just crying. Crying and crying and crying. And then, like, 20, 30 minutes later, my mum goes, Come on, we're going back. I'm like, what do you mean? We're going back? Back? Where? Back there? I don't think so. And my mum immediately as soon as I'm like I don't want to go back she flips and she goes it wasn't that bad oh you're just being silly let's go back it's fine stop crying like oh it, it wasn't that bad of a situation Chloe immediately like just belittling how I feel and my emotions and things and like, oh you're overreacting I'm not overreacting I think that was actually a very valid response to have when you're seeing someone flip out on the verge of a fucking breakdown and then you know you just start crying you're scared what else are you supposed to do start laughing and dancing like what what on earth response was she looking for um and there was another point there was another time where again my stepdad he went to like a work party a work do and it was midnight at this point and obviously on a night you lock all your doors and my mum was texting him and she said, if you don't come back by this time, I'll lock all the doors. And he's like, no, you won't. She's like, yeah, I will. So she locked all the doors, but she left her key in the lock. So he could not get in. And obviously, he's a he's drunk. Angry. So he, ascent, well, he did smash his way through the back door because we had like a back door with a glass panel and then next to the door was a little glass window. Smashed his way through the window, unlocked the door, got in and then he must have texted my mom or rang her or something she went downstairs they have another argument and that's that but again I was terrified like when he was because I could hear him smashing his way in glasses not quiet and he smashed his way in and I run into my mom my mom he's in he's in because he's drunk he was very much a man who could be nasty let's just say if he wanted to and I did not know I didn't think he'd harm me, but you never can be sure. So I did not know what was going to happen from this situation. So I run into my mum's room. I'm like, mum, I'm crying. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. She's half asleep or she's pretending to be. And she's like, Chloe, just go to bed. It's nothing. Ignore him. You're fine. I'm like, I'm not fine. I feel like I am in like a fucking horror film right now trying to escape the killer. I don't feel anything close to fine right now but yeah um 
the fifth is that they don't respect your boundaries. Now, I am actually, because I did record this once before, and this whole thing about respecting boundaries took me like 30 minutes to explain. I will do a separate, just like a little mini episode on this because I think a lot of people can resonate with it. Now, I'll briefly go over it because, and I'm going to say trigger warning, sexual abuse, because I searched about this specific topic because it's still something that terrifies me, honestly, in my brain to this day. I've got a lot of negative feelings about this. I was not sexually abused physically. I have never experienced that. And I don't want to diminish anyone who has. I don't want it to sound like, oh, I'm, I went through the same. I didn't in any way, shape or form. I searched about this specific thing and it was kind of a 50-50 split. I did not find any like official website about this thing and anything like that. I found a lot of forums. Half of the people said that it's very normal for children to witness this and whatever. Half of the people said it's sexual abuse. So I'm going to put the trigger warning there just in case because I don't want to speak about it and have it trigger someone but I am going to do a separate thing about this completely so I'm not going to speak about it now you're free to carry on listening but the next episode probably will be covering this topic so don't listen if you don't want to the title will give it away but you know but yeah not respecting boundaries now that could be anything for me it was more sex and being exposed to sex But it can be they barge into your room because it's their house. It could be that they go through your phone because it's their phone. If if you're younger, you can't pay for a phone bill. So they'll go through your phone because it's their phone and they just want to know everything you're doing. And you've basically got no privacy. Lack of privacy is a better way to put it. Um, The sixth is lashing out at any criticism. Now, one story is about my sister's wedding and me... Me, like I have my dad and then my sister and my brother share the same dad so we have different dads and at my sister's wedding my mom at this point was married to my stepdad and my sister also invited her dad because it's her wedding and my mom my stepdad and then my sister's dad they were sat at opposite ends of the room so they weren't gonna bump into each other at any point but my nan was at this wedding And she went and spoke to my sister's dad, so my mum's ex. And my mum hated this. She was embarrassed, you know, everything. And that same night, or even the morning after, I'm not entirely sure, she rang my nan and absolutely berated this woman for speaking to her ex. And the the, the end of this was that she didn't speak to my nan for like five, six, seven years. So I also didn't have a relationship with my nan because of my mum. And the criticism, it's... My nan said to my mum, look, you're being silly. I'm allowed to speak to who I want. You can't tell me what to do. And my mum, at this criticism about you being silly, you're overreacting, just doesn't speak to that person again. She did. She does speak to her now, but it's a very strained relationship because of, obviously, the fallout. Um... And also with me, towards the end of our relationship, me and my mum, I somehow found the voice. I can't remember exactly what scenario I was in. We were having an argument about something. And I said to her, you're being very unreasonable right now. I think it was when she was demanding my keys and my phone. And I said, you're being so unreasonable. Like, I've only just decided that I'm going to live with my brother. And immediately, you, you're trying to kick me out. I mean, she already did. <laughs> but... You're trying to get rid of me, essentially, like, wipe me off the face of the earth. And immediately from that, she flips and she's just saying, I'm being I'm being rude and I'm the one who made my decisions in life and I need to live with them. And, and it's just such a drastic change. The minute that they get criticised, they're immediately on the defensive. Um, now, the seventh is an expectation of admiration from her children. And it's almost like... a a need like a drive that they have to be be felt like to to feel like they are adored by their kids like their kids see them as these like holy beings oh my god that's my mom I love her so much now don't get me wrong kids love their parents if 
think of a, a very standard nuclear family kids love their parents like if if you're the parent that does their utmost to do the best for their kid kids love you you know like you've got a very good stable relationship there but this is more so like they have to brag to their children about how honored they are to have them as their parent so my mom always it's it's like yeah it's like they remind them of what an amazing mom they have so my mom all the time and it's like ingrained in my brain she always used to tell me about how she was an a star student and she always did so so well in school and she was like on the road to fame basically um and in her career quite early on she became a manager which you know it's a very big achievement but she was like I was a manager at such a young age I was doing all of this and and it's like people can do that you're not the only one but it's it's bragging rights she just wants to brag like I did this it's like yeah other people do as well and it's a very big achievement don't get me wrong but every week I was getting this story regurgitated the same every week and she's like, Chloe, look at me. I'm such an amazing mom. Look, aren't I amazing? That's that's what it is. Um, the eighth is that they ignore your needs. And <sighs> I was fed and cared for. I did not go without in my childhood. But it was always underlying. So as an example, say you fall over as a kid. You hurt yourself or it's just a shock. You start crying. Mom, dad, whoever runs over. Oh my God, are you okay? It's okay. Don't worry. Stop crying. You're fine. I'm here now. You'll be all right. Normal response. My mom's response would be, you're fine. Stop it. Get up. You don't need to cry. It's fine. Stop. Like, stop overreacting. And it's like a lack of empathy. But it was different when other people were around. Then she had all of the empathy for me. And you do feel invisible to your parent at times, almost, to, like, a narcissistic parent. It's literally like you're trying to speak to a brick wall. You've got a better chance seeing pigs fly, you know? Like, it's just nothing is going to get through to this person if they don't care to listen. And then if I was ever telling her stories or anything or... I was like, oh, mom, I feel this way today. Immediately it's on her. Well, I've had a really hard day because I've done this or someone said this or... And I'm like, all right, yeah, yours is worse. And that also leads me into often presenting herself as a victim. Now, from what my mum's told me, and again, take it with a pinch of salt, I'm not going to say her stories aren't true. And the stories she's told me, in some cases, and the stories I've heard from other people, she absolutely was a victim at some points. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But the way that she tell me stories is like she had such a, such a hard life. And she did tell me things which weren't true, which I found out were not true, did not happen. And they are bad things that she's lied about. But it was always, 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 I've had such a hard life. I had to fight for everything or struggled. And she didn't. That really was not the truth. And like I say, I'm not victim blaming. She definitely did suffer some awful things in life. But not all of them were true. But she made it seem like every single month she was struggling with something up until now. You know what I mean? Like it's. And like the whole thing with my stepdad as well. It takes two to tango. They were very toxic for each other. They shouldn't have ever gotten together. I don't know how they last 11, 12 years. That in itself is a fucking miracle. But she'd always say, look, he doesn't care for me. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And I'm like, mom, you also throw abuse at him every single day. Every single day. You've never got anything nice to say to the man. And there's probably a lot more going on that I didn't see as a kid. So... So, yeah, this is overall the the traits of a narcissist. Now, like I said, if your friend, family, whatever, only has one or two of these things, because I think everyone to a degree has some of these things, they're not a narcissist. I think, like, four, five, six traits. But you have to think about, does it seep into every aspect of their life? Because if it does, narcissist. If it doesn't, 
not narcissist. I want to say it's a fine line, but it isn't, it isn't, you know, like, just don't assume someone's a narcissist, <laughs> like, but to be fair, when you know, you know, it's quite obvious, um, but now I, through all of this, did not cope the best, I will admit, I didn't really have any coping strategies, I, as soon as I was kicked out, I was living with my sister on a sofa, and then I moved in with my brother, and I immediately just had to start living life like normal, I did not cope with it in any way, I've kind of just had to accept that this is how I feel, and move on, which yes is coping, but I didn't think about any of it, well, I did think about what happened with my mum and everything, but I never thought about it from like a therapy kind of perspective, because again, I didn't go to therapy, I can't afford it, but I do think it's important to just put in a little segment here about some coping strategies because I wish I wish that I knew what I was doing and I really didn't. So one of them here, it says set boundaries. Now, the only way that I can see this as helpful, and again, everyone sees it differently, so maybe someone's listening like, shut up. But a narcissist doesn't respect boundaries. That's just, they just don't care because they don't respect you. So they don't respect your boundaries. But if you set a boundary, if you say outright, I don't like it if you barge into my room, you need to knock. If from that point on they knock, then it helps, it helps you feel less stress because you haven't got to worry about are they going to budge in all the time like, oh like you have your private space then which is very very nice to have with situations like this it's nice to have an escape but if they don't respect that boundary and if they just barge in again you in your mind it kind of helps you realize what kind of person they are because and I do want to generalise here because it's a very common theme, it's not always, but it's a very common theme that when you're in this kind of relationship with a narcissist, whether it's a parent, partner, friend, you have these rose-tinted glasses on and you really don't see it for what it truly is. And it's only when you come out of it, it's always the same, it's only when you're out of it and you just reflect back on past experiences with this person and you think, they really did not give a shit about me. They really didn't care. They just did what they wanted and if I didn't want to go with it, then it was end of the world scenario. But set boundaries, see how it goes. If they don't respect it, that's when you can kind of look. It just helps you kind of take the glasses off for a moment and from there on you can kind of deal with trying to get out of that relationship or at least seeking help and things that's how I see it anyway that may be absolutely totally wrong but that's how I see the one and then another one which I want to stress this so 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 much do not take it personally don't take any of it personally now this is a lot easier said than done and I only did not take any of it personally a few years down the line when I was sorting through everything in my mind because I was like I can't live like this anymore and the only way that I can see it, how it worked in my brain is that instead of viewing a situation like I said this so then they flipped out in this way, you need to see it as they flipped out this way all because I said this one thing. So, like the thing with my mum, I blamed myself so, 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 so much for so long because I said, oh, because I felt uncomfortable, because I said I wanted to leave, she then kicked me out and she caused this whole br bravado all because I didn't feel safe in my own home. But I saw it in a way of like, I caused all of this, it's all on me. And it's not. I flipped it then and said, my mom kicked me out. She 
declined any conversation she hid a lot of things from me she basically alienated me from her life all because I didn't feel safe in my own home having a strange man stay there the night and it paints a very different picture in my mind to, to see it in those two different ways. Instead of saying, I caused this, you see it as they caused this because I felt unsafe or I wasn't happy or I felt like they crossed a boundary. And it really does paint a different picture. That helped me a lot. It may not help others, it may, I don't know. But that one absolutely helped me a lot. Um, and then another one is just seek help. So whether it's with a friend, a, a, a family member, a parent, if it's with if the narcissist is another person, or even a therapist. Now I want to stress so so much. If you have the funds and the time, please do go to a therapist. I unfortunately can't afford to do that. I really, it's extortionate how expensive they are, honestly. But if you can please do because I know how much it can help and change a person and it can help you deal with things a lot quicker and you will have to face some very hard truths maybe but it really does help instead of like six years down the line it may be only three you know what I mean like it's it just helps you a lot more but even if you have a friend or a family member a cousin aunt uncle a random internet stranger it could be me like you know if you have someone who can just give you such an unbiased view of things, it really does help you just sort through your mind. And even if, and honestly, I've done this and I'm not ashamed. If you go on Reddit and you just ask people, what do you think about this scenario? And you get so many different answers. You get people on one side, on the other. You get people in the middle. You get people half on one side, half on the other. You get people who are just like, all of this is just shit or all of this is amazing you get so many different perspectives and I really do think it's worth it sometimes honestly like it's helped me with a lot um so yeah I am also and I'm not again I am not a professional in any way but I will put my email it's it's a, like a work email but I will put my email in the description if anyone wants to contact me whether it's to ask me a question ask for advice whether it's to suggest something even if it's to tell me I'm shit I really I really don't care but you can contact me if you want if anyone feels comfortable doing that and none of it's going to be public it'll all be private so but I do think it's crucial honestly to take care of your own mental health narcissists and dealing with them can be very mentally draining and that's kind of how they work. They kind of like drill you down and then you're very pliable in what you do or how you act with them or what they can make you believe. So like I say, it's very clever what they do. But maintaining your own well-being is essential. So if you can do one of these things for the self-help, please do it. It really does help. So yeah, that's it. Um... Like I say, the next episode will go more deeply into the not respecting boundaries because it's quite a big topic for me personally. Um, but yeah, that's all for now. So I will see you in the next one. Bye.